Hello and welcome to this week's episode of What Your GP Doesn't Tell You with me, Liz Tucker, the podcast that produces medical journalism, not PR. I really hope this show will be of interest to both doctors and patients, because of course doctors are patients themselves too. This podcast aims to reveal stories from the world of medicine that others don't, won't, or only very partially report. And that means I'll be exploring not just the science, but also the politics and money behind it. This week, I'm joined by Professor Carol Sikora, one of the world's leading cancer experts, who talks about his experience of treating cancer patients over the last 40 years, and explains what patients need to understand to ensure that they get effective cancer treatment in the UK's NHS. Much of his advice, I think, will also be very useful for patients in other countries too. I know from both my family and friends, being diagnosed with cancer is one of the most terrifying experiences you can go through. And so knowing how to navigate the healthcare system can make a huge difference. Carol argues those patients who take an active interest in their care are in the strongest position to get the best treatment. When I was editing the interview, I thought there was so much useful information that I didn't want to lose. So I've actually split Carol's interview into two parts. This week is the first part. But before we get to this week's interview, I'd like to say a huge thank you to all the people who are becoming listeners to the pod. There are now listeners in 38 countries, so I'd love to hear your thoughts about the podcast and where you're listening from. And you can email me via my website, whatyourgpdoesnttellyou.com. And for a new podcast, if you've enjoyed the pod, it really helps its visibility if you could leave a review on Spotify and other platforms. That would be a huge help. And a reminder that you can find out more about the podcast via my Substack newsletter, Liz Tucker. Dot substack .com, and follow me on Twitter at Liz C. Tucker. So now back to the interview with Carol. Professor Carol Sikora has been a consultant oncologist for 44 years and is also a past director of the WHO Cancer Programme. We started the interview talking about how much cancer care has changed since Carol first qualified as a doctor. Carol, many thanks for joining the podcast today. Pleasure, Liz. What's it like as a doctor when you first have to tell a patient that they've got cancer? What goes through your mind? In the old days, it was difficult. We didn't tell people. When I was first a consultant, because I'm a very old consultant, as you know, uh, you know, 43 years ago, I was a consultant. And uh, then we didn't tell people anything. They had no information. The medical establishment carried the notes and the notes had on them not to be handled by patient. And under no circumstance you were taught as a medical student should you hand the notes to the patient. And therefore, the cancer diagnosis was never given out. And we had elaborate lies about it. Uh, that's all gone. And it's a level information playing field now. The difficulty is not so much telling people they have cancer, but telling them that there's nothing more that can be done for that cancer. And we all handle that very differently. We talk about it now, uh, over the last five years, the phrase is managing expectations, telling people that the chemotherapy you're going to give them for metastatic cancer, it could control the disease, but it may not. It certainly won't necessarily cure the disease. You're going to have to live with this till you die. And that sort of conversation is the way in which younger doctors are trained to communicate to cancer patients, dampening down the expectations of miracle cures. And that's the big problem is how to tell people there's nothing more that can be done. I think there's still that awful fear when cancer is diagnosed. That's exactly it. And you know, when you read the media, you read, uh, t watch television, you read books, novels, and so on, cancer d does carry a death sentence. But most of the good news with cancer is you cure it. And there are cancers we can cure, even when it's metastasized widely, germ cell cancer, lymphoma, and a range of other cancers. And the other thing about cancer, it's totally unpredictable. You can suddenly get what are called Lazarus-like effects, where someone just gets up from the, what seems to be a terminal situation. You give them a relatively simple, maybe old, very old-fashioned and cheap drug, and they just get better. And they go on for, well, no one goes on forever, as you know, Liz, but we you go on for a long uh, and lasting life and productive life. So there's so much we don't understand, even this, this age of biomarkers, personalized medicine, and miracle cures. We just don't understand why some people respond and others go downhill really fast. 
Does that mean, though, that even when you think there looks like little hope, you have to leave a bit of hope because you could be wrong? The great question is how much hope do you leave people when you know that the results are going to be terrible? If you remove all hope, then people go to pieces. And, you know, the complementary medicine movement and the alternative medicine movement prey on hope. We had a great project at Hammersmith with the Penny Bronze Centre in Bristol, the Bristol Cancer Help Centre. And the argument between the alternative practitioners and us was being realistic with hope, realistic outcomes. They didn't want to give bad news. And we said, you have to give people the, the reality of the situation. I think that's the difference. And different, different doctors, different nurses, different patients all have different views about how they want to be told things. So, But if you compare it to the beginning of my, when I was first a consultant, you didn't even mention the cancer word. It wasn't on the wall and there were no leaflets. That was totally different. And of course, it took the problem away because you didn't know, and then you wouldn't ask the right questions. It's an amazing idea, isn't it, that patients don't have access to their own records? I, it really was. I remember as a medical student, Middlesex Hospital, and the, all the notes had stamped on them not to be handled by patient. And, but even still, still, there were, you know, I, I had a patient that wanted to come for a second opinion. And I said, well, look, by all means come, but we do need some data. There's no point you pitching up in my clinic. We need a pathology report and we need some imaging, ideally access to the scans, which you can get now on, on computers or a, a, an imaging report. And they were very about it. The, 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 the clinical nurse specialist where she came from told her that, you know, it's, it's more than my job's worth to give you the pathology report. Why? It's her pathology, for goodness sake, not the nurse's pathology. And that attitude that there's something secret, that patients can't have a level playing field with health professionals, it, it's completely wrong. That's extraordinary, isn't it? But you think, Carol, it's really important that for patients, they actually need to take control of their own treatment. It shouldn't be your life in their hands. Absolutely. Uh, the patients that do well, I have many stories about patients that have taken control of it. Um, so, so, sometimes it's infuriating uh, for, the, for the health professional when they go to an extreme uh, and want to keep very good notes, draw graphs, ask you questions about it. But that's part of their way of dealing with the illness. Others don't want to talk about about it. My favourite story of someone that didn't want to talk was actually a professor of um, cardiology uh, at my, old, my own hospital at Hammersmith and long gone now. At the age of 72, he developed metastatic prostate cancer. And what was amazing was his way of dealing with it. He didn't want any information. He just wanted, when he got a pain for the metastasis, he wanted a single fraction of radiotherapy. He didn't want to talk about it. Just fry me with your magic toaster, he would say. There's the spot. <laughs> Don't bother with x-rays, just aim the beam there. And he did this six or seven times. He'd keep the taxi waiting outside while he had it. Everyone was very amused because I was very deferential because I'd been his houseman once. So I was very deferential to him. And that was his way of handling it. But you think as a cancer patient to really get the best treatment, you do need to take an active role. I think you do. The problem is, if you don't ask, especially in Britain, you don't get many of the time. So uh, I've had many examples of patients that have been not asked about things they didn't understand, and they've just not been offered things like hormone treatment or chemotherapy and so on, when they clearly should have had it. But for some reason, it's been omitted. The trouble with cancer treatment is you only get one bite at the cherry. The, the first way through is important. If you miss something out the first time, you can't necessarily correct it. If the disease recurs. You've got to take every opportunity at the beginning. So being an informed patient, uh, not necessarily an aggressive patient, no point taking it out on the staff if you don't like what's going on. That's but likely certain, to be counterproductive, I would imagine. Exactly. So you can be assertive, but not aggressive. So as a patient, once you've had your cancer diagnosis, what sort of research should you be carrying out to find out what the options are? The most important information you need is the pathology report and the imaging report. These are the two things without which no one can give you an opinion about what's going on. Once you've got that, 
the main thing is to find, read about that cancer, go onto Google, look at reliable websites. The best is probably Cancer Research UK. Another excellent one is Macmillan Fund. These are the two best British ones. The NHS ones are sort of laughable in the simplicity in a way. Much better to go to CRUK or Macmillan. They're, they're more realistic. And I do that to look at drug, drug protocols. They've got them on there too. Um, then you can look at research going on. So if you feel you, you'd like to take part in a clinical trial, you can see that easily on either of those sites. And then there are specific charities that deal with single types of cancer, Pancreas UK, Prostate UK, and so on. And they've got a lot of information. The problem with the web, of course, and Google, is there are a lot of nutters out there with uh, unrealistic sites offering all sorts of magic things, from gadgets that cure cancer to clinics in the Bavarian Alps that will charge you £10,000 a week for all sorts of treatments. So uh, the web has to be used with care. But if you stay with the reliable sites, the ones I've mentioned, then you're really on the way to getting as informed as possible. The other website that's useful is Google Scholar, because there you find all the publications in that particular area of disease. And what about the leading American research institutes? All the big hospitals from Memorial Sloan Kettering, MD Anderson in Houston have websites. They also advocate getting a second opinion. Second opinions are only of any value if you have all the data. Without the data, if, you know, if someone phones me up, and often I get requested by the relative of a patient. So they phone me up and somehow, or it's a friend of a friend, and they, and they start telling me the story. And I say, well, what type of cancer is it? Where is it spread? Uh, it's, it's absolutely of no value. What you need to have is the data. Data. Getting the full information is the key. Sometimes patients are a bit nervous about asking for a second opinion because they're worried about insulting the first doctor. They are. And certainly in the past, that would be it. I, mean, I remember one of my colleagues when I was a registrar telling this patient who was very polite about it, saying, do you think I could get another opinion in London? This I was a, uh, a registrar in Cambridge. And the consultant said, if you do that, you, not, you can never darken my doors again. <laughs> I mean, I just, just appalling behaviour. I mean, I, well, that was a bit odd. He was a lot older than me. <laughs> Probably not older than me now, but he was a lot older. <laughs> So if you've done your research as a patient, how can you then use that research to sort of feed into the treatment plan that the medical team are devising? I think it allows you to gather a series of questions, maybe five or six questions that you can just go and ask. And it may be that you've gone down the wrong route and that in reality, there are a range of other options that the, you're actually proceeding with that are perfectly viable and that it's not really relevant and that you, you can then rest assured. If on the other hand, uh, you're not so sure and you think there is something that you could get, you can ask for a second opinion or do you offer this treatment here? Uh, and in that way, you allow, you drive things. I'm convinced that informed patients that ask questions get better service anyway, because the doctor, under the doctor, the team looking after them understands that they want to seek out the best possible care and they'll respect them for that. So I think just being a passive recipient of care, which is what the NHS has brought about. We're all passive because it's free. You're not the customer. Someone else is paying for the bill. You're not really important to the to, to, to the system. The system wants everybody to have the best health care possible, but they're not really interested in you as a person. That's the system. The doctors may be interested in you as a person, but the system isn't. So it's a matter of trying to break through that. Once you understand that you're not important, that's good, because then you can see how you can become important. The demeanour and the way in which you handle it is critical. And I think that's, that's something I, I've seen patients stand up in the reception, use four letter words at the receptionist because they couldn't get an appointment. This is getting them nowhere. At the same time, you have to be pretty persistent and not frightened of the system. Does it help to have somebody to advocate for you, whether that's you know friend or family? Because sometimes if you're actually the patient, that's, it's quite hard to advocate for yourself. Absolutely. So take for a critical meeting where prognosis and treatment is going to be discussed, it's best to take someone with you. It could be a friend, it could be a relative, could be a brother, sister, um, something. Uh, but just because they'll listen in a more distant way. And um, the other thing we can do is record it on a phone. And the doctors don't mind. Is, is that true of all doctors? No, I, I think now now most doctors are used to it. I, was, I remember about 10 years ago, not only recording on a, on a phone, but also a video camera was set up. <laughs> and Gosh. that was a bit off-putting because we're not used to that yet. 
but uh, but certainly a phone just so you've got it and you can listen to it at leisure and go through the answers again and and you know it, it's particularly applies to complex situations where there are multiple options and your 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 views are being asked for now in modern medicine that's a recent thing to happen so breast cancer prostate cancer are the two ones where there are many different ways of doing the same thing and individual patient preference is part of it but if you've done a bit of reading so you understand what the options are you then go the options are given to you it's often very useful to have it recorded so you can then go back and you know many patients just say what what would you do doctor or if it was, a, if it was breast cancer, what would you what would you recommend for your wife and that's a reasonable question uh, and then i would i'd be honest i'd tell them what to, to do but I think there are many decision points where, although we, we pay lip service to involving the patient as the customer, um, we don't really. We just sort of bully them into it by just pushing them down a road to fit the convenience. And, it, of course, all this sort of stuff takes time. And that's one thing the NHS doesn't have in a cancer clinic. You know, most new cancer patients when I started as a consultant, were given 15 minutes. Now they're given half an hour, uh, but sometimes that's even cut short. And half an hour is not long enough to go through many people's questions about not just what they have and their outcomes, but also the alternatives that they could have and the options and then how it's all going to work out. But just the other issue, if you're a private patient, you'll usually see the consultant and the consultant has more flexibility. If you're an NHS patient, you won't necessarily see the consultant. So if you go in and you say, well, actually, this is your standard treatment plan, but actually I'd like to try something different. The junior doctors won't necessarily have the authority to make those changes. That's right. And you know, there's good evidence that seeing the same patient, seeing the same doctor each time, you know, I feel when I see a patient that I've known for years or even just six months and I've been responsible for their care and seeing them every time, I can deal with it very quickly and everybody's happy. I'm happy. I come away relaxed. The patient's happy. I hope they go away relaxed and uh, everybody's good. But the system in most NHS departments, Hammersmith, Addenbrooke's, Cambridge, is you have a pile of notes of the patients waiting outside. The first doctor available picks the top one off the pile, unless there's some special reason. And unless there's some difficult problem, the registrars will see, the junior doctors will see the patient. And then only if there's a problem, come to the consultant. So looking at the different aspects of cancer treatment, for many patients, one of the first things to be discussed will be surgery. If you're going in to see a surgeon, what kind of things do you need to be asking as a patient? So I think the most important thing with surgery is what surgery is going to be carried out, how extensive will it be, has the cancer spread from the primary organ, and what am I going to feel like after surgery, and how long will I take to recover? Those are the sorts of things. And also, are you a high-volume surgeon for this type of cancer? So how many of these operations do you do? Yeah, exactly. I indeed asked that question for somebody who I knew had a good record, but he was very shirty. First of all, I said, how many of these do you do a month? And he said, quite a few. So I said, well, could you sort of specify? He said, well, quite a lot. And I said, well, it would be just really helpful to have a number. And I had to ask him about four times. He's really reluctant. <laughs> I know. There's good evidence that high volume surgeons for a particular procedure have better results. On the whole, if you go to a place that's doing one type of cancer surgery, you know you're probably in good hands. And it's not just the guy that does the cutting that's important. It's the team behind them, including the rehabilitation team and so on. I think one area which often doesn't perhaps get the attention it should is radiotherapy, which is actually an incredibly cost effective form of treatment. And I think patients tend to think of it's, it's all much of a muchness, but there's a number of different forms of radiotherapy. There are, you know, 150,000 people a year in the UK get radiotherapy. 60,000 get it because of palliative treatment, but 90,000 are getting it because of curative treatment, breast, prostate, lung, all sorts of other brain, all sorts of other parts of the body. It is very effective. And what what has made it so effective over the last 30 years since I've been uh, doing it is is the fact we can image so much better. You know, I trained before computers, before CT scans, before MRI scans. So it was an approximation of where you thought the cancer, a lot of guesswork. Now, no guesswork. The computer is actually doing the planning and it's delivering the radiation very precisely to that. So 
precision radiotherapy is with us and it gets better all the time. And it really doesn't need the doctor. The, the, it's taken, the, the computer's taken the doctor's skill to delivering the, the right dose for the right part of the body to avoid normal tissue. The danger with radiotherapy are that what's called the organs at risk, OARs as they're called in the jargon, that uh, the organs at the side of the cancer that you want to avoid. You can't avoid all of them, but you can avoid most of them and you can concoct a plan that avoids them. And different types of radiation, such as proton beam radiotherapy, uh, brachytherapy, where you put radiation as uh, isotope into the tumor, all tend to be there because they avoid critical normal tissue. And for radical radiotherapy, where the patient has a very good chance of being cured, it's really important to do that because otherwise they'll get long-term side effects, which they'll have to live with maybe for 30 or 40 years after completion of radiation. Proton beams are an enigma. It's been around a long time, since 1944. Um, But it's got cheaper and much more practical and connected to the same computer plans that we use for conventional radiotherapy. So I think by 2026, it'll really be widespread because clinical data of randomized trials will be published by then. And I think most people that know about it will avoid conventional radiotherapy if it's in an area where you want to stop the radiation going beyond the cancer. The attraction of protons is they stop and you can control where they stop. It's called the Bragg peak. The radiation goes in with the protons, goes to the tumor and then stops suddenly immediately after the cancer or can be made to stop suddenly. So that is a, a, a new way of being very precise about delivering radiation. And there are other ways. And you think for proton beam at least, that we will get the the cost down enough that the NHS can afford it? I'm sure we will. At the moment, there are two NHS centres, Manchester and uh, University College in London. Uh, The problem is that NHS are trying to keep it in the box. They don't want it to go out because if if a patient says, I've heard about proton therapy, would it help me? What are you going to say? He said, well, it might, but you can't get it on the NHS. Uh, So it's not a useful conversation. So I think what will happen eventually, uh, it'll become available. It'll be much more widespread for not so much specific cancers, but specific cancer situations where the normal tissue and the tumor are very close together and the protons allow you to get a, a plane of cleavage between normal tissue and cancer. We know that generally speaking, that actually what you want is a targeted approach and the more targeted, the better. It avoids the problem of otherwise healthy tissue being damaged. But the problem we have at the moment is you may get highly targeted radiation or you may not, depending on where you live. Exactly. 15 years ago, it was much worse. There was something called IMRT, intensely modulated radiotherapy, which coupled with image guided radiotherapy or IGRT allowed an image to be taken and then get this very precise radiation. And the NHS had the equipment for about five years without actually using it because it was installed and the software was installed in all new linear accelerators, the, the workhorses of radiotherapy around the country. But the training time, management time and so on, it was difficult. So some patients got and some patients didn't. And so I think now it's a lot better. Everyone on the whole within the NHS are getting IMRT, but not everyone's getting protons. And that's probably the next hurdle. IMRT may be available for large parts of the NHS now. There are a number of other forms of more specific radiation, which still seems limited. The NHS will only allow them to be used, in fact, for certain forms of cancer. Whereas if you're a private patient, the consultant could decide if appropriate, they will use that same radiation for a much wider group of cancers. That's right. There's something called SABRE, stereotactive ablative uh, radiotherapy. And, and that is very useful if someone's got metastases that respond to chemotherapy, but there's one or two left behind. That's where you get a zap, a single zap off, and maybe two or three zaps uh, off those spread of cancers, and it goes away. And, and it's variably available. In other words, the same patient in 10 different parts of the country may get different responses. Some parts they'll get it, and other parts they won't get it. In some, they'll be offered maybe into a trial to maybe get it, maybe not get it. And and that's unfair. And of course, if you're smart and you understand the system, you can work it. And of course, those that work the system tend to be better educated. They tend to be white. They tend to be middle class or 
higher and they tend to be on high incomes because that's the demographic you're dealing with. They know how to manipulate a complex system that has poor leadership on the whole and poor uh, doesn't have to really publish the fact that there's these disparities between different parts of the country. So as a patient, you really need to know, for want of a better phrase, how to effectively work the system. And I think you've talked before at Hammersmith how those in the know can override the system. I think when Tony Blair thought he might be having a heart attack. Tony Blair was at Checkers and he had chest pain. He drank too much coffee, it turned out. I think that's the story that the cardiologist put out. He had chest pain, I think it was on a Sunday afternoon in Checkers, which is near Aylesbury, perfectly decent hospital in Aylesbury. Uh, and yet they took him to Hammersmith because they knew at that time that was the only place in West London you could get instant stenting for a coronary. So they took him past all these hospitals. A similar story, a patient of mine, who was lovely as she had long-term uh, chronic myeloid leukemia and she'd come to the clinic very regularly and she'd always get the nine o'clock slot and I couldn't work out why was she always getting I'm fairly punctual and uh, a Monday morning clinic there she was at nine o'clock and she was away by nine fifteen. blood count down off she went and I asked my secretary, how come she always gets that nine o'clock slot? She said, well, she always wants to see you. She knows you're early. She knows there's not many people waiting. And she gives me a bottle of wine at Christmas. So I fix it for her. So she, she targeted the right person for the bottle of wine. Targeting me made no good because I don't do the appointment system. But my secretary does. She was savvy enough to understand who was important in the food chain. I know when my father was in hospital, it was much easier for him to see the urologist while he was still there. Yeah. And of course, the appointment came forward for some three months hence. So I rang up the urologist secretary, explained the situation. And yeah, she was a decent, rational yeah. human being. So she sorted it out. Yes. I mean, I, I, you know, the people in the health service, or in all healthcare systems, are there because they like dealing with people and they're there to try and help. One of the problems has been that uh, the lack of information technology throughout the NHS, which stands out across the whole of Europe, we're the worst. You know, the computer on my desk at Hammersmith when I started in 1986 had some the, the, the date of birth, the age, the address, and some lab data, and that was it, some pathology reports. Now it doesn't actually have much more. It certainly doesn't have clinic information. about the, the, And certainly we don't integrate general practice record with hospital record certainly if you pitch up in the emergency room there's no way the doctors there can call on some national computer to work out what's happened to you yeah, the police can do it for cars they can check insurance and registration with dvla and so on instantly but we just can't get that level of sophistication for healthcare. other countries have done that and we need to get there and that just seems bonkers yeah. And, you know, it was tried um, 15 years ago. and It was a disaster. We spent 12 billion pounds on it and uh, it, it was just chaos. And the only thing that's good now is imaging that, that there are systems in place. If you have a chest X-ray in uh, John O'Groats tomorrow, we can see it an hour later in London if we have the ap appropriate access codes. And so all radiology, all imaging around the country, scans, MR, CT can be visited visualised anywhere. Now, one of the things you think that it's really important for cancer patients is they should be aware of the cost of their treatment. Yeah. I mean, given their NHS patients and they don't have to pay, why should they be aware of the cost? I think you have to understand a lot of people don't attend for chemotherapy or they don't attend for clinic appointments. Medicine costs an awful lot. Eh? The cost of doing anything, whether it's just a simple chest X-ray, a full blood count or more complex treatments with cancer drugs are very expensive. And uh, one of the reasons the health service is so expensive is that no one really counts the cost. There are drugs that are called generic drugs, which have lost their pay patent. And a lot of those are as effective as more modern patented drugs. The pharmaceutical industry want you to use the latest and greatest, but if there's no indication for them, better to use the older proven and cheaper drugs when possible. So use ibuprofen, not neurofen. Exactly. I go and buy Paracetamol Boots' own brand, and it, it's half the price. I don't understand why people, of course, the brand name drugs are all pushed forward on the shelf. You can see what they're trying to do, because the shop is getting more money from selling the high-cost branded goods and selling you their own generic 
products. So uh, it, it is crazy. And all doctors do the same for when they buy drugs for their family. They just buy the, the non-branded goods. But cancer drugs, you know, when I started at Hammersmith, uh, the most expensive drug was Taxol. And that was about £4,000 for a single injection. It's come down now because it's generic. But now we have drugs that are up to £100,000 for a single injection. And it's beyond the health economies of everybody, even the United States. And one of the reasons why drugs are so expensive, they're really aimed at the United States market. 75% of all cancer drugs in the world are sold in the United States, which is less than 5% of the population. And the US also pays the highest drug prices in the world as well. Exactly. There's something called parallel importing that the drug industry don't like. The idea for drugs cheaper in Romania than here, you, someone can go there, bring it back to London and sell it here. I mean, with the health service, no one's going to make money out of that. But in individual patients having to pay for the drugs do. And, you know, what happens in the States, a lot of people use online pharmacies to deliver drugs from Canada where they're cheaper than in the United States. And, you know, we have patients here that have accessed high cost cancer drugs through Canada because it is cheaper than getting them in this country when they have to come at full full price from the States. Well, I'm certainly aware of some consultants who advise their patients to go online to buy drugs that won't be provided by the NHS. That's correct. But is there a bigger issue about knowing your cancer treatment? Because if you've got a cheaper cancer to treat, costs may not be an obstacle. But if you have a particularly expensive cancer treatment, it may be the NHS may take a population level decision. Yeah. They don't want to pay those costs. Whereas you as an individual, what you're concerned about is individual treatment, not population level decisions. That's right. And, you know, I was there when NICE came into being, the National Institute of Clinical Excellence, to try and standardise who was going to get what. And it sort of worked. Then. Unfortunately, what happened with cancer, because it was so expensive and politically charged and that people couldn't get something that everybody could get in Europe, they'd go right to their own peace. They've created the Cancer Drugs Fund, the CDF, as it's called, which is a bit of a disaster because it's semi-secret because the pharmaceutical industry have contracts with the NHS, but they don't reveal the price. They're commercially sensitive, which means that no one really knows what the comparison is. So the, the concept of NICE is that you try and equalize all healthcare interventions and have an economy that takes certain level and then above that you have to pay for yourself. I mean, it's difficult to compare clinical services for deafness in children, for example, with someone dying with leukemia and the cost of treating that versus the relatively low cost of dealing with hearing problems in small children. Uh, and NICE have tr- done their best to try and make a, a financial plan to allow decision makers to do just that. And it, it's got to be commended. That's obviously the way to go. The question one would have is, how come in Europe they don't seem to have these problems? They do everything and they do it reasonably well without spending a huge amount more on healthcare, maybe another 5% more, but not, not a huge amount. So if you don't get the drug that you want, what's the best approach as a patient? So the best approach is to have an honest conversation with the consultant. You've heard about this drug. You're wondering why would it, first of all, is it appropriate for you? And if it is appropriate, why aren't you getting it? Why can't you express an interest in getting it? What do you have to do? And just asking that can actually work wonders. And suddenly uh, the the form for the Cancer Drugs Fund arrives and the consultant fills it and that's it. I had a patient, an extreme example, when Taxol was difficult to get the drug that was about £4,000 a shot. A medical litigation lawyer pitched up in my clinic at the end of the clinic when you're just, you know, you feel like I need to go and have a drink. I don't mean that sort of drink at lunch time. I need something. I need lunch. Uh, and so uh, she pitched up, a very plausible lady, saying, I need tax on. I say, you do. You do need it. But, but I, I come from Luton and the PCT there wouldn't give it to her. And it was the, 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 the primary care trust that was in the old days, the CCG equivalent. And they wouldn't give it to her. So she pitched up at Hammersmith and said, you give tax on here. I want it here. And, and there's no reason you can't give it me here. She was quite nice about it. She wasn't aggressive, but she was right. There was no reason. So I did it. And they built Luton PCT and they had paid. So, I mean, it's uh, it was, that just shows administrative craziness. And she, she, But she achieved what she wanted and she got tax and she responded. And it was amazing. The problem you might hit as a cancer patient is that NICE has ruled a particular drug that you want is too expensive. 
That's right. And you have to pay for it yourself. In many hospitals, mixing private and public funding is difficult. So they will say, well, if you want to have that drug, you have to go to either a private hospital or to the private wing of the NHS hospital. So you've got an IV in, you're having two drugs there. The third drug, you have to go somewhere else to get. And maybe even a different doctor giving it, which makes it much more complicated. It's much better if you just have one system, you top up, you pay. But that is, again, politically charged because not everyone can afford to top up with a drug that may cost £20,000 for a shot. Only a limited part of the population can do it. And if you do think, I'm sure my treatment's being delayed, I'm sure it should be going faster, something that can really stress cancer patients. What's the best way of dealing with that? The best way is to politely phone the consultant secretary and find out where things have got to. You'd be surprised how many times things slip through. Appointments that are for a scan that are going to be made, you don't get the appointment. Don't assume. And I, even computers make mistakes or the, the, the wrong code gets put in and nothing happens. And Carol, what role do you think immunotherapy and the increasing individualisation of care is going to play in future cancer treatment? Yeah. So the future of cancer care is about personalization. So Mrs. Smith and Mrs. Jones both have breast cancer, but they may have very different treatments, very different amounts of treatment. The number of cycles of chemotherapy we give, usually six, it's snatched out of air, snatched out of air 50, 60 years ago. And we've never deviated because we know it works. Almost certainly some patients would benefit from two cycles. Others may need 10 cycles to get the same effect. It, If using genomics, using a whole range of biological markers from the cancer, we may be able to work that out. And I think artificial intelligence rears its ugly head to try and sort out the problem. Look for patterns that we can't see as doctors, because you need to look at hundreds of thousands of patients, similar patients, not just a doctor with his lifetime experience. He or she has seen 10,000 patients in their life. That's the sort of level. We need hundreds of thousand patients' data to work out. And that sort of data mining project, these are all underway now. So it'd be interesting to see where it goes. So I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of What Your GP Doesn't Tell You. A reminder, you can find out more about my podcast at my website, whatyourgpdoesnttellyou.com. Sign up for my Substack newsletter at liztucker.substack.com. And follow me on Twitter at Liz C. Tucker. Putting together a podcast like this requires a lot of work and resources, financial and otherwise. So if in the coming weeks you feel able to support the pod, that would be hugely appreciated. You can either sign up for a monthly subscription on patreon.com slash what your GP doesn't tell you, or make a payment via PayPal on my website, what your GP doesn't tell you dot com. Next week, in the second part of his interview, Professor Carol Sikora discusses the catastrophic impact that COVID has had on the UK's NHS cancer services. Arguing as a result, over the next five years, we'll see a huge increase in cancer mortality and reveals how the well-off do better in a system, even when it's free. And we find out just what an NHS pillow manager does. So do please join me again next week to find out more. And many thanks for listening. Bye for now.